In past documentaries, I have been tasked to examine race, religion, and even social class. But now I've been handed my toughest assignment yet, sexuality. It's not easy to talk about LGBT issues on national TV. But as these issues continue to fracture societies, religious denominations and families around the world, it's time we confront the tensions between those who want more acceptance for LGBT people and those who do not. There is a view that your sexuality in the eyes of your religion is a sin. I don't believe that my sexuality is a sin itself. Is it seen as wrong, homosexuality? The sex act, of course, is seen as wrong, but the person is not. The conversation really has to be shifted. I've been personally accused of not fulfilling my duty as a mufti because I was seen to not have objected in very strong terms to the repeal of 377A. And I come face to face with how deep the divide can get. I wish I had the same kind of support and love from my family that I have from the public. I feel betrayed and broken-hearted. I am not a good mother. Have you ever been worried, like, why is your son like this? Really? How deep-seated is this divide? The government announced plans to decriminalise gay sex. There is room for accommodation, even on such contentious issues. Debate over Section 377A of the Penal Code continues to intensify. The repeal was met with mixed reactions, suggesting a divided society. When we think of the divide, we probably imagine something like this. On the one end, you have younger people, liberal in their views. They may be LGBT themselves or allies, which means straight people that support LGBT acceptance. And then at the other end, you have the older generation having a religion that sees homosexuality as a sin. Christianity and Islam. They may be more likely to be conservative. But is the divide that we're trying to bridge really as simple as one camp versus the other? If I get a sampling of Singaporeans of all ages, religions and sexualities, to what extent will their viewpoints fall neatly into these two camps? Earlier, I put out a public call for Singaporeans to, quote, share their views on Singapore society in a social experiment, unquote. What I'm going to do is find out what you think about certain social issues. Singapore should be accepting of people of different ages, races and religions. You agree, go this way. You disagree, go this way. Well, I'm going to ask you the second question. Singapore should be accepting of people of different sexualities. If you have the same view, then you stand still. If you change your mind, then you move to the line that reflects your opinion. While most people held their positions, a third of them actually moved to the left, indicating that they are less willing for all sexualities to be accepted. So, Surya, you've moved your position uh, yes, for the second answer. 
Uh, why was that? I feel that it goes against the nature of uh, things, of how natural things procreate. I'm slightly against. Okay, would you go as far as crossing over to the other side? I guess I'll jump over to this. Okay, you're gonna go all the way there, okay. Just, just, just this side, not all the way. Okay. Did you change anyone else? You, yeah, you, I changed. You changed? Oh, because for me, um, I grew up in a family whereby we are like very, uh, a bit like homophobic. Yeah. Okay, okay. Chen Hao, you strongly agree when it came to race, age and religion, but, but not so much for sexuality. Why is that? It's just I don't feel it natural. Chen Hao, there's an assumption in society that young people, especially young people who perhaps are not part of a, a faith, will be very supportive of the LGBT community. I feel that right now we are accepting them because for the sake of accepting them. Okay, the question is, are you okay with LGBT individuals expressing their sexuality in public? Okay, the, the, the reason I disagree is uh, not just for LGBT, but in general, or I don't think it's the right morale. And then uh, with my culture brought up, it's, it's not so right to do it publicly. So you're saying that it's you're not taking the view only for LGBT individuals? In general, yes. Ike Seng is the only older Singaporean who disagreed. Most of the older generation don't seem to mind. Why did you agree with the question? Well, I think if uh, non-LGBT individuals are allowed to kiss, hug and hold hands in public, LGBT individuals should be accorded the same form of uh, respect. I'm okay with LGBT politicians. Okay. I am okay with an LGBT individual as my child's teacher. As we move away from public figures to people with a more direct impact on our families, the divide grows more stark. I'm okay with LGBT storylines in family dramas. Okay. Irvin, I'm going to come to you first. For this issue, you disagree. I only get like in the future, like my son and daughter watch the dramas, and then they might have a sh uh, shift minded of like you know it's okay to have the same sex marriage and all. So the previous questions were about general acceptance of LGBT people, uh, but it sounds like from your answer to this question, you wouldn't be so accepting if it was your children. Yes, correct. One of the things that I took away from that is that it's impossible to predict how any one person is going to view these matters. We all hold nuanced views on the basis of many different factors. And you certainly can't tell from one's age, race or religion. And while most people were okay and accepting of LGBT persons, it's a different story when it comes to their own family members. News Platform Today ran a survey in 2021. They polled over a thousand respondents between the ages of 18 and 35. A high proportion of our youth, 80%, are willing to work alongside LGBT people. When asked if they would accept a friend in a same-sex relationship, the proportion saying yes was 75%. When it comes to forming friendships themselves with the LGBT community, it was still quite high, 73%. But here's where there's a big jump. When it comes to their own family members being in a same-sex relationship, the proportion who would accept this was only 58%. It makes sense. Our family members are the closest to us and we have dreams and aspirations for them, so it's natural to worry once we find out that they are LGBT.
Sean Fu is an openly gay filmmaker. And Cheryl Tay is a fitness and lifestyle content creator who started posting about her relationship with Grace two years ago. From their online presence, it seems that they have thriving lives and careers, despite being very public about their sexuality. But I wonder if their profiles tell the whole story. Cheryl works with international brands and has 50,000 followers on Instagram. Cheryl, did anything change for your work when you started posting that you were dating a woman? Um, I don't think so. I've not had any clients or anyone come and say, I don't want to work with you or like, I want to drop you. So none of that. I've had so many strangers like sending me DMs. Talking about like what inspiration we are, you know, I'm like, me? Like, okay. But when it comes to family, I... Uh, I'm very sad about it because um, I'm very close to my family. I just genuinely develop feelings for someone and she happens to be a woman. But they cannot get their head, they cannot wrap their heads around this concept. Um, and they didn't speak to me for, for months after that. Cheryl, do you think it's odd that the public accepts you but your parents don't? Oh, we can try a different question first while you think about that, if you like. I'm just trying to... Um, that, that question kind of... hit a nerve. <laughs> uh, I wish I had the same kind of support and love from my family that I have from the public. But yes, uh, it's really hard that, you know, I have strangers coming to me and showering me with so much love and my parents just, you know, choose to turn a blind eye to it. And how are things now? So I don't live with my parents anymore. Yeah. I live with Grace. Okay. I'm still part of the family, you know, Chinese New Year, birthdays, weekly family dinners, I still go back. But they pretend that she does not exist. So there's one part of your life where she is very much part of everything yes. and things are going just fine. And there's a family life where she's not part of it. Is that okay? I don't know. I wouldn't... It's, it's almost like a double life, right? I want Grace to be part of the family. So I'm stuck. Oh, how much do I want to push? So I've come to this, like, stalemate. It's been like that for two years. It's hard to tell from her social media, but Cheryl feels accepted on most fronts, except the most crucial, her own family. The very first question I'm going to ask is, how is it like coming out to your family? Just remember to talk about then and now. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, go. Sean Fu creates web content on LGBT issues. This is all for Dear Straight People, a content platform he founded which blew up in popularity after it started publishing coming out stories of Asians, including his own. I came out to my family in 2017. I wrote a letter. So while I was at work, I just texted my parents. I just said, read the letter under my, my pillow. So they did read the letter and it was a very emotional uh, thing, uh, like, you know, uh, my parents were crying, I was crying, slammed the door, that kind of stuff. And one of the first things they said was, don't tell anyone. For my parents, they are very concerned about what the relatives think, what the friends think, that they have a gay son. For them, they see it as like a, a stain, like a shameful thing. So, unbeknownst to my parents, I continue being out on social media and running this report and uh, being out in a very public way. Up to now, they're unaware that I'm so out. So in their mind, they know that their son is gay, but they think he's, like, he's closeted publicly. Your parents told you not to tell anyone, not, but you've made a career out of telling everyone. <laughs> and then, here I am on national TV, <laughs> being very out. <laughs> Are you worried about something going wrong when you burst their bubble this way? I feel like it is necessary for us to progress further, because it's been five years. I'm in my 30s, you know, and I think at the end of the day, I want to be able to bring my partner back home to them. Because I feel like I'm living in two different worlds right now. I've always said, like, when a child comes out of the closet, their parents go into one. Both Sean and Cheryl have always wondered what others would do if they faced the same situation. So I booked a room with a one-way mirror. Here, Sean will get a chance to share his story to a room full of strangers. 
Cheryl will do the same together with her partner, Grace. I already came out to my parents once, five years ago. They didn't accept it and told me that it was a shameful thing. Now that 377A has been repealed, should I try to seek acceptance from them again? Very evenly split. I choose yeah because I think that because we shouldn't, I mean, we should be truthful to our parents. Huh? Sounds like a straightforward question, but Sean has many considerations. Whenever I bring up any topic related to my sexuality to my parents, we get into a big fight. Which gets awkward at times because I still live with them, so I see them on a daily basis. But I'm also kind of a public figure in the sense that I do sometimes appear in LGBT-related content and I've also acted in LGBT shows. So there is that concern that they'll find that out on their own. I, I can just uh, uh, tell them, like, or uh, lie to them, say that video is not real, it's all scripted one. It's all in the film, maybe I'm acting as gay, but of course I'm not a gay. Earlier, you mentioned that you should always be truthful to your parents. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Contradicting, uh. yeah. I was slow the whole time, but I decided to move to yes, because anyone could easily send a link to my parents. Maybe I can explain to them and like, use, this, uh, use this opportunity to maybe tell them that Look at how many people are like supporting the LGBT community too. So eventually, I hope you can support me like how they are supporting me. So I've been living with a woman, my partner Grace, for two years now. Is it time to bring her to my next family gathering, even though my parents pretend she doesn't exist? I still believe that she shouldn't invite her partner to the gathering because her partner will not get any respect from her parents. And I don't think it is good mentally for her partner. Now they may not accept her in person, but slowly, gradually, I think uh, people's mindset will change. Last. If like both partners, if their love is uh, very strong, then I mean like they will hang in there. Like. Whenever I do something that my parents disapprove of, they have a tendency to retaliate by leaving me out of family activities. And that really devastates me a lot. Bringing her to the next family gathering would risk me getting cut off again. Family, they're okay with me being cut off from family activities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My partner Grace feels very guilty seeing me so emotionally affected by my parents just because of our relationship. Uh, I guess it's time to take a break from all this conflict. You have to respect yourself as well as your partner. We've completely left ourselves out of this equation. It's always been about other people. Their comfort, their happiness, respect mm. for them. Mm. We never considered where our own limits mm. lie, I guess. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So what is your final choice? Yeah, what's your final decision? In a way, I've made my career about my sexuality. Um, I feel like it's just a matter of time before my parents um, find out about the fact that everyone knows. 
But at the same time, if I do decide to tell them again, I just know that it'll be a bad day for all of us. There was one part where both when y'all were equally split down the middle, 50-50, and I was like, this is exactly how I feel. Like, I like how he was very positive. Like, you really think love can conquer all, but love is not enough. Ah. <laughs> My key takeaway from this is that when it comes to sexuality and family acceptance, there are no easy solutions. Because Sean and Cheryl don't want to compartmentalize their homosexuality from their own families. And I really get the sense that they want to stop leading double lives. I want to hear from the other side. Parents who struggle to accept an LGBT child. It took us two months and countless rejections before the team finally found someone brave enough to share. This father agreed to speak to us on condition that we mask his identity. Uh, tell me about the moment you found out that your teenage son is gay. I know his password. During showers or sleep, I check his phone. And there's some pictures of them hugging, then I say, is this a girl or a guy? Then he willingly tell me that it's a boy. How did you feel? Definitely, I feel angry. Which parent want their kid to behave that way? I believe none of us. So when I asked him, hey, why you do this to me? He got no answer for that. So what I did is, I informed his mom. How did she respond? She feel same as how I feel. She found that my son is abnormal. She's like angry, disappointed, and pissed off with him. But I told him things really happened. We tried to find a solution on it. Maybe we can send him for a counselor. But she reluctant of doing that because she doesn't want everybody to know that her son come that way, you see. We had a big argument because of this matter. So she's like blaming me. She doesn't want to take care of the kid. So she just left us without informing us. Even I asked my son, did your mom message you? She said, no. So everything is on my shoulders. How did you cope? Previously, I was a very cheerful person. And suddenly, when this thing happened, I just let me alone. I took a lot of leave just to be myself. And I think so, a lot of MCs, my superior, they approached me and said, this, this is not you. Was this a difficult time for your son as well? I can say so, because he did message me, I'm sorry that it is not I want. This is not me. I don't know why this happened to me. The feeling just come naturally. Did, did you try to make him change? Yeah, I did. I want him to be a normal person. Even though it's so difficult to do this? I have to go through this, and I will not stop helping him. I think I will not stop until he's totally changed. Do you think you might ever change and accept him as being gay? Not at the present moment, because I still hope that he will change. I was struck by how much he was consumed with shame. And to think he's been living like that for five years. Finding out about his son's sexuality led to a mental health crisis and his family breaking down. I really do feel for him. It's going to be really tough for father and son to find a way to come to terms with the situation. This is Euphoria and her mother, Michelle. Azhar and Fauzi are father and son. Yes, you. They went through a tumultuous period when the parent had to come to terms with their child's sexuality. My memory of that entire period was just like, I don't remember what happened. I even uh, went into depression and lost so much weight. When she saw me, she said, Mommy, why you lost so much weight? Yeah. Actually, I never really came out. Eh? Never, never, never. Tapi kita belum dia nampak, kita belum dia tahu. Ya, who you are, magi. Have you ever been worried, like, why is your son like this? Worried? Hmm? Yeah, of course worried. Since then, both pairs have made peace. Yes, but until today, the parents have not had a frank conversation about their child's sexuality. So the team devised an exercise for them to open up to each other by getting them to discuss common terms used by the LGBT community. Okay, 
What is the meaning of closeted? So it's like, it's a secret? Something yeah. like that. So, correct. Just means that you are hiding. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I confess, I read, I read her, her journal actually. <laughs> like, why do you decide to read? Okay, I read because I want to understand you more. That's, that's mm. all, you see. Mm. Yeah, I, I didn't know because you never say anything, so that was nice. Come out. Come out meaning like, um, keluar. like keluar dari closet. Mm. All of us, there will be a point in time like kita nak share our true self. Luarkan. Luarkan. Yes. Luarkan. It's okay. But apa, no need to hide. Yeah. yeah. Tapi eh, ada orang, some of us, right? Um, there are some kids out there, they are scared to come out to their parents. Takut nak luarkan. Actually, I, I felt that when I was in my secondary school. Bapa rasa bapa nampak tak? From baby, I know. From baby, you know. Yeah. Really? Yeah, and mama also. And mama also. But how come you didn't... I, 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 I felt so scared to tell you guys. Because uh, from baby, you don't like a uh, toy car. I don't like. You don't like. You only like uh, anak patung. Okay. <laughs> jangan terlajak, jangan terlebih. Terlajak. Uh, terlajak. Uh, that means more. You, you are you are afraid that I might turn into a woman. Let's say I yes. want to be a transsexual. Uh, yeah. I have a lot of transsexual friends actually. They are very kind people. You are an ally. What does that mean? You think? Mm -hmm. I cannot guess. Out someone like, like you are not part of the LGBTQ community, but you support them. Because i got so many gay friends as well. That's true. Yeah. My gay friends also ask me like, Michelle, we are gay, you can accept us. Why can't you accept your daughter, you know? Orang-orang ally is people who support oh, like, LGBTQ. Like we support you lah. Yeah, you are. You are an ally, actually. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. see. Support. Tak hina, tapi songkong. Oh my god, I love that. Bapa rasa macam ada yang sedara-sedara ada cakap tak pasal ya anak kau asam macam ininya? Ya, ada. banyak banyak orang cakap. I have a lot of pressure from from all the grand aunties and your ama, your granny, you know. So that is the the time that I'm so stressed, I'm so pressured. But then later part when your daddy tell me just don't bother. After a while when you wake up already and you think that your child's or children's well-being is more important than every other thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We are all humans. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. Peace. Peace. No, no war. war. My dad taught me this. Can I give you a hug? Thank you. It's so crazy because I don't usually have this conversation with my dad. Euphoria, Fauzi and their parents, after years, have come to some acceptance. I've also earlier met a father who is struggling to accept his gay son. I want to hear from more parents out there. So my team reached out to LGBT support groups who help parents. One faith-based group responded and got their members to write down their deepest thoughts. I feel betrayed and broken-hearted. But the worst feeling that is killing me is guilt. I am not a good mother. I'm the one who made him like that. It really is my worst nightmare. He's a sweetheart, the kindest among his siblings. How could it happen to him? I suspected he was gay. So long as it remained a suspicion, there was hope. With the suspicion confirmed, I had to move on to deal with loss. The loss that he will not have the opportunity to have a traditional family, such as a church wedding, or the birth of his own child. Our son is intelligent, multi-talented, and loved by family and friends. But will he continue to be loved if they know he is gay?
I cried a lot just thinking about the kind of future he would have. It's our greatest hope and desire that he will be given a fair chance in life and that he'll be accepted and valued for who he is and not be branded as weird or queer. It goes beyond shame and stigma. These are parents expressing the very real fears and anxieties that every parent has for the future of their child in an uncertain world. It's heartbreaking. And the issue becomes even more difficult to deal with when there's another layer of complexity. He's now so far away from church, he is lost. My greatest fear has been that my daughter would give up on God and her Catholic faith. The reality that he will have to face uncalled for criticisms and judgment as well as discrimination both in church and in society broke our hearts. We are filming this after hours at a cafe because the individuals I'm about to speak to want some privacy. They all have a contentious struggle that doesn't get talked about very often. How do you be religious and LGBT? There, there is a view that your sexuality is a sin in the eyes of your religion. Would you agree uh, with that? Yes, I agree. Homosexuality is a sin and that's clearly said in the Bible. How about yourself, Saren? Definitely. I would say it is a sin. It's already mentioned in the Quran itself. So my view is it's quite different from the other participants. Uh, it's what we do with that sexuality that, uh, that decides whether it becomes a sin. The four of them are from two major religions that are more conservative about gay rights, Christianity and Islam. How do you see your relationship with your faith? At one point of time, I kind of gave up because I was saying that, hey, this is not going to work out because God, literally the book says it's, it's, it's haram to be in love with someone else of the same sex. But then at one portion it says that, but in many other portions it says about, hey, he's, he's all about forgiveness, he's all about all loving, he's all about acceptance. So I asked my dad, like, you know, I am in a situation whereby I'm in conflict. I love someone that the text says I'm not supposed to, but then, you know, the text also says that God is all loving and stuff. So my dad said one thing and then it really like impacted me a lot. It says, do what is good in your own terms and whatever that you do right, God will still love you because He made you. So that's just as important as it is. Then he just like, he asked me that, are you happy? If that's all that it is that you are looking for and it doesn't impact anyone else, then you are on the right path. Do you still see yourself as struggling between two identities? No, not anymore. Why is that? So I used to be a lesbian for 23 years. I got married to a woman in Canada, and we were the first five couples that got to marry in, in Toronto. I was proud living a very vibrant lifestyle in Canada. I wanted to bring it back and tell people that, hey, you know what, it's okay to be gay, but now since 2018, I'm no longer identifying myself as a lesbian. I just want to have a genuine relationship with God. What about yourself now? Do you see your sexuality as something to be overcome or something to be embraced? Uh, overcome. I want to stop being a gay, but it's not easy. How do you reconcile then? I have to keep it to myself, so I have to state that, oh no, I'm still straight. If you believe that what you're doing is wrong, is a sin, why do you keep doing it? Even how strong our faith is, we can't stop our desire. I see. Uh, our desire, temptation, yes. Even how pious you are, you pray, but we can't stop your desire. Saran, can I ask you, mm. do you see your sexuality as something to be overcome in order to be a good Muslim? Oh no, none at all. I don't see myself overcoming it. Uh, it's really part of my life. The people around me accepted me the way I am, and I can go to the mosque, like, I, I even went for Umrah and stuff. I was accepted. Um, Calvin, is there a conflict between your sexual identity and your faith today? I, I grew up in a free thinker a family. My mom is a traditional conservative woman. 
uh, I think a part of it has to do with a fear of me not being accepted mm. by society, by the extended family. So she she is very hesitant. Your uh, parents' anxiety, that was not driven by an issue of faith. They, you no. said they were free thinkers. Yes. Every time I had to hide something about my weekend or hide something about my life, I felt like I was telling myself that I'm not okay. And over the years, it has accumulated. And in 2019, right, I had some mental health crisis. Then I turned to the church. Uh, I became a Catholic in uh, 2021 at the age of 37. I think it's my faith that actually helped me to come out, to show up uh, fully accepting myself as a gay man. I realize that there are two almost opposite approaches to sexuality and religion. On the one hand, you have Naz and Karen, who believe that same-sex attraction is something to be overcome, that you can't act on it. On the other hand, you have Kelvin and Sarian, who believe that being in a loving, gay relationship doesn't get in the way at all of them being a good Catholic or a good Muslim. But not everyone can accept an LGBT person being part of the faith. How are the leaders of these religious communities dealing with this? Earlier, I spoke to four people who are trying to reconcile their sexuality with their religion. How are their religious leaders dealing with the collision between LGBT concerns and religious doctrine? Father Adrian Danker is the priest in residence at Church of the Sacred Heart. But behind closed doors, he has been quietly helming a prayer group specifically open to LGBT Catholics. This is the first time he's speaking openly to the media about this ministry. Father Adrian, you were explaining a little bit about what you do in the ministry that you run, but I've heard it described as a secret prayer group. I think for the longest time, we've been very careful to keep it cloistered and safe, right? So it's secret to people who do not know, but it's always been part of the life of this church in Singapore. My hope is that by, by doing this interview, right, we share a little bit more that as a church, we are a community that wants to care for the people and the people includes LGBTQ Catholics. Do they have a fear that you're going to ask them to convert or ask them to change? Our role is not to fix you or repair you, right? Our role is to welcome you home, accept you as you are, allow you to say, this is me, struggle as you struggle, yes. But in that struggle, to allow you to find what matters to you to live a fuller faith. And sometimes that fuller faith is to say, I am LGBTQ but I'm also Catholic. And because I can do that, it is that long process of coming to a reconciliation. So it's not about choosing one over the other, but recognizing that that's part of our reality. But the church never says that for you to come back and be a Catholic, we need you to be repaired or to be converted. Is it still seen as wrong, homosexuality? The sex act, of course, is seen as wrong. We believe that sex is for the purpose of procreation in a loving relationship between men and women. Anything outside that is sin. But there's a bigger understanding of the person that goes beyond just a reduction to the sexual act. And the conversation really has to be shifted. Do you encounter naysayers to your approach? This ministry that you've been asked to set up? I have encountered people who don't quite try to understand I've encountered people who basically say, why should we give attention or care to this community? Some people say, it will never happen in my family. We're a good Catholic family. We will never have an LGBT child or a cousin or a father. But one of the things we try to do, and that's why we're very sensitive, is how to educate the larger Catholic population that this is a reality, the reality that amongst us, there are LGBTQ Catholics. That is a fact of life. For now, there are about 60 LGBT Catholics whom he ministers to. He's also quietly set up a support group for their parents. Both groups have been growing. 
Immediately after the repeal, the National Council of Christian Churches responded publicly. They stated their concerns about the possible repercussions of the repeal. But like the Catholic Church, they are committed to helping LGBT Christians. And actually for the Muslim community as well. When the Prime Minister announced the repeal of 377A, the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, or MUIS, issued a statement which it said took a few months to put together. Mufti Dr. Naziruddin Mohammed Nasir oversees religious rulings for Muslims in Singapore. He was first appointed in March 2020. Where we are, it's a little bit out of the way, but it's a, it's a beautiful setting. I do find nature uh, very inspiring. It uh, gives you kind of a clarity of thought, in particular when you think about uh, very difficult and complex issues. You hadn't been Mufti for very long before you had to deal with LGBT issues in the community. What was that like for you? For people who struggle with the religious position and continue to have ambiguities on it, we have an answer for them. We say that if you're in doubt of whether, as a Muslim, you can practice homosexuality, then our response is, no, you can't. But we're not just dealing with that religious position for individuals who have queries on whether you could practice homosexuality. The issue that we're dealing with is what's happening in society. We don't want the community and the society to break up because of these different um, attitudes towards the LGBT issue, and not especially because of religion and what the faith says. Is that balance reflected in the statement that Muiz put out in response to the proposed repeal of 377A? I think it's the first attempt at trying to really grapple with those complexities. The LGBT issue has so many dimensions and aspects to it. Uh, there is the legal aspect to it. Uh, there is also the, uh, for Muslims, the theological aspect to it. There's also the very important social aspect. It's, it's multi-dimensional, uh, so it's highly emotional. It's dealing with people's lives, with people's values, beliefs, aspirations and struggles. And I think however and whatever people feel about it, that feeling is quite uh, visceral. So people tend to take very strong positions on this and you could be on, on either side of the um, debate. And I think a sensible and a responsible religious guidance and leadership has to take into account all these nuances and complexities and considerations. So it's not black and white. But there are people who will say that it is black and white because they would consider it a sin. And what do you say to that position, that it is as simple as that? These opinions, I suspect, are held uh, very dearly and strongly and deeply by people. I think they would be angry and terrified with a position that is seen, uh, deemed to be very inclusive, very open and tolerant. Um, I've been personally accused of uh, not fulfilling my duty as a mufti because I was seen to not have objected in very strong terms to the repeal of 377A, for example. People considered that we have taken a very liberal, open view on homosexuality. How do you ensure that religion, and Islam in particular, remains relevant to that process of a modernization in a fast-changing world? There is an assumption that religions, in particular if you look at uh, Islam, is anti-change or anti-modernity. It's always a counter-current to progress and modernization. And I think that's a very inaccurate view of Islam as a faith. We have always taken the position that we should contribute to this conversation in a very constructive way. Despite the views of the leaders, I think there are still some members of both communities, both Catholic as well as Muslim, that have a sense of homosexuality as being unacceptable. And so it's, I'm finding it hard to get an understanding of what this inclusion can look like. 
That's why I've been told to come to this neighborhood on a Sunday evening. They say, I don't want this, this, this amana. It's too heavy. And I don't want it because I am afraid of it. Every alternate Sunday, this group meets up in this mosque with Ustaz Muhammad Abdul Majid to reflect upon verses in the Quran. It is by invitation only. The five people attending are LGBT Muslims. It all started when Muis wanted to initiate an aftercare program for former inmates who are transgender. And this mosque agreed to host them, despite the possibility that other mosque goers might feel uncomfortable. Since then, it has grown through word of mouth to include other LGBT Muslims. Why was it important to have these sessions in the mosque, given that it can attract some controversy? The significance of the mosque is symbolic. The point is that they don't feel alienated from the house of God. What do you do in these sessions? We don't put any expectations on them when they come. They have to dress a certain way or anything like that. The idea is for them to come as they are. Their intention is to get connected to God. So what I try to do is provide that connection through reading of the texts of the Quran. Do people sort of think that it's a sort of conversion therapy, you know, that this is some way to fix them? There has been instances where people ask me, like, what exactly am I doing with them? Because mm -hmm. they think I'm trying to make them straight. I can't change their orientation. I can't change who they are. That's not up to me, no matter how much I try. Are they looking for acceptance from the Muslim community? Perhaps on some level, but what they want, first and foremost, because they come to the mosque, the acceptance that they are looking for is from God. That's the, the point of these sessions, like to tell them that you already are accepted by God. This really hasn't been an easy documentary to do. Trying to deal with the complicated relationship between homosexuality and religion listening to deeply personal stories of families struggling with acceptance. I'm grateful to everyone who shared their stories with us. Listening to them, I'm even more certain that there are no easy answers when it comes to LGBT issues. But I really hope that this show can help those in a similar situation navigate the fault line. <laughs>